Today I'm going to be checking out the immensely heavy Snapmaker A350T. So let's unbox this thing and check it out. Well, this is already shaping up to be quite a confusing unboxing. Let me guess, we've got another box inside of here. Wow, this is the most well-produced instruction manual I think I've ever seen. It looks like this is built out of five linear motors that are all interchangeable. So that helps cut down on the number of unique parts. Then we've got some filament, power module, touch screen and controller, tools and accessories, tool heads. We've got three of them, so that'll be fun to check out. Adapters and brackets, cables, a work platform, and the base of the machine. So this is a big die cast base. Wow. Big solid piece of aluminum to build this machine off of. We're gonna be starting with a strong foundation here. It's been a while since I've unboxed a printer and been excited to read the instruction manual and put it together. They're definitely pulling out all the stops to make this a memorable and cool experience. On the front page, we've got their message to you, which is to make something wonderful. It's a nice message. Okay, step one, attach the feet to the base. Inside the tools and accessories box, we've got everything we need to get started. We've got a nice box with all of our fasteners. Work holders, these are like clamps that you can use to secure your pieces that you're working on. And safety goggles. We've got regular safety goggles and laser safety goggles. Wow, this is a really cool looking control board. These are really nice connectors. This is just fancy. Look at all this stuff. How luxurious. Looks like we've got the rubber feet inside of this toolbox, so let's get those installed. All right, next step, all linear modules must be assembled in their intended position. Just grab two of these boxes that say lead 20 millimeters, pull those out, and these will be used for the Y axis. And we've got yet another die cast part in here. And this will be the platform that we attach all of our other types of platforms to. Looks like they put some paint on there too. This thing looks slick, very lightweight and very strong. So let's uh, attach this here. It looks like we're threading into steel inserts here. You can see they've got a bunch of steel inserts pressed into this frame. All right, next step, we've got to attach this base plate. I'm just gonna load a fastener into each of these holes. Then I'm gonna screw all these down. Then it wants you to go through this frame and tighten those last bolts that we were working on. All right, and then I'm gonna go ahead and make sure all these are tight. All right, then we're gonna flip this back right side up and put these brackets on. Then we've got a little touch screen holder. Looks like there's some magnets on the back, so it'll be magnetically retained. That's pretty nice. All right, up next, I've gotta pass these under the machine here and pop out of this little hole. All right, next step is to attach this cool control board to the side here. Ah, oh, shit, I installed it upside down. Ah, oh, shit, putting this backwards again. Mm. See, when you give people the opportunity to plug things in incorrectly, they might plug things in incorrectly. So it'd be nice if, you know, they did a three-hole pattern or something. This printer is definitely not designed with poke yoke in mind. Oof, I don't like this. I don't like this one bit. I feel like I'm gonna break something here. Okay, that was the first part of the assembly where I felt like things were a bit iffy. Everything else here is super solid, but I mean, this is just kind of a, not the best design here for securing these. It'll be more than strong enough because these are just to hold wires in place. But you're tightening bolts down onto things that aren't proper holes. That's, uh, I think we can do better than that. But now that it's in place, hopefully I won't have to worry about it again. Next up, we got some more cables. This one says Z, so I'll plug it in right here. These are cool little connectors. You can see all the little leads in there. Looks like we've got six small leads, which will be for the stepper motors and limit switch. Then two large leads, which are like power or something. Not exactly sure how these work. And wouldn't you know it, I put this on backwards. Uh, shoot, well I gotta flip it around now. So there's this concept that Toyota engineers came up called Pokeyoke. I've brought it up before. But basically it's the idea that you design an assembly so that it can't be assembled incorrectly. This thing, 
with its clean design and its symmetric parts. And that's great that the parts are interchangeable, but it really opens up a can of worms in terms of mistakes when putting these things together. So honestly, I'd rather them make this a little bit more idiot proof so that it's harder to make these mistakes during assembly. And they could do that with more clear labeling, like putting labels on the parts, like this side is to the left or whatever. That would ruin their nice clean aesthetic here, but this is just kind of annoying because I'm having to put this together again. Hmm. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is your designs need to be thoroughly idiot proofed before you send them to me to review. So anyways, looks like we need to plug some stuff in here. Oh, I'm not supposed to pull these out. So now that we've finished assembling the motion system, we come to a junction and we basically need to decide if we're going to do 3D printing, laser engraving and cutting, or CNC carving. Personally, I think 3D printing is the most fun out of all these three options. So I'm going to go to page 40 and we'll set up the 3D printer. All right, 3D printing. This is what we want to use. And let's take a look at this tool head. This looks like a pretty well-designed assembly. All right, so we've got a single drive gear in the back to push that filament forward. This is a nice little extruder tensioning system. I guess you just push in and flip that switch. So push that in, flip the switch, and that locks it in place. Unlock it and you can pull it out. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of adjustability on here. This extruder looks like it has some pretty big teeth. It looks like there's no gear reduction and it's a single drive gear extruder. We'll give it a shot and see how it works. That's an extremely small spur gear. So that means it should drive the filament with a pretty high gear reduction just from that gear being so small. However, when you have a low tooth count gear, you end up with more issues with cogging. Generally, you don't want to go below 10 tooths on a gear because imagine you have a gear with like four, it's not going to be able to drive anything smoothly. Looks like we've got a stepper motor in there. Seems pretty heavy. They've got a decent sized stepper motor. Looks like there's a fan right here, which will blow air through the little heatsink fins. That'll keep the hot end cool. Or maybe that's connected to this duct down below. It's a pretty compact design, and I doubt I'll be able to find out too much about it without completely disassembling this thing. Right here, we've got a little inductive probe by the looks of it. We've also got the CNC head and the laser head. I really think the strong suit of this machine should be 3D printing because 3D printing is the most approachable out of these three options. All right, I just attached this tool head. I don't really like having to use fasteners to attach and detach these things. It'd be much nicer if you could just snap this off and snap another tool head on. I mean, this is the snap maker after all. Just a quick note here, here's your M4 by 10 fasteners and here's your M4 by 8 fasteners. So you definitely don't want to mix these up. If you put the M4 by 8s in, it might actually tear those threads out of the aluminum and that'd be a pain to deal with. So you're going to want to double check and make sure you're using the M4 by 10s here. And for Snapmaker, I would advise to make this part thicker, at least 8 millimeters thick, so that you can't install those 8 millimeter fasteners in there. That's just a little bit of extra dummy proofing you can do to protect dummies like me. Let's see how it works. It would be nice if it was strong enough to actually pick the whole printer up by it. Resist the temptation to just pick this thing up by the spool holder. It won't be good for anybody involved. The other thing is, since the filament is unspooling this way, you're going to have some traction. And if this ever came loose, then you'll have a tendency for the spool as it's being fed to further loosen this up. So if they did it the other way around, it would be self-tightening, which is generally something you'll want to do. If you can make something self-tightening, then you don't have to worry about it falling off or working itself loose. But you're just going to want to make sure that this is nice and snug and you shouldn't have any issues with it. This doesn't look fun at all. I've got to install 22 frickin' hex heads. Whoo! That does not sound fun. Let's see what you have to do for the laser cutter. Oh man, you got to do the same thing. You have to do all these fasteners up every time you want to change the functionality of this machine. Well, I can tell you that that's not going to happen. So this is just going to be a 3D printer for now. All right, here's our heated bed. Looks pretty nice. You can see this grid, this little maze of wiring traces. 
This is very similar to the Prusa design where on the back side you've got magnets and then on the front side you're heating from the front which should actually give you better control over the temperature of your 3D printed goodies. Also you're not relying on that refrigerator magnet material. I mean this is pretty nice. This is a huge print area and with the gear reduction that they have on these linear axes it seems like they're really torquey, which will lend itself to having excellent acceleration. Also, this is a 320 by 340 millimeter build area, so that's actually the biggest 3D printer that I've had on the channel so far. All right, well, I'll get these uh, flathead cap screws, and we'll screw all these in. All right, those are all screwed in. That didn't take too long. I guess switching that over wouldn't be that big of a deal. It's definitely going to be way more secure this way, using all these different fasteners. But having something that could just snap in place, I mean, when I hear the name Snapmaker, I kind of expected it to be like that. All right, then we'll place our print sheet on here. Looks like it's a double-sided design. It kind of looks like a polycarbonate, which is similar to what I've used on a lot of other printers. I generally don't like how sticky these surfaces are. All right, and then the heated bed gets plugged into this big control module in the back. All right, here's the power supply. It's this aluminum looking brick. It looks really nice. It kind of looks like an Apple product. Do you think they got any inspiration from this? One of these? The one thing I don't like about it is that it's not built into the machine. I understand that if you're doing CNC work, you'll want this to be isolated somewhere where it won't be able to get damaged. If you're making aluminum or wood chips and having them getting sucked into the fans here, that could cause some major issues. There are ways around that, like if you elevated this up high, put it up here somewhere, or put like adequate filtering in front of it, in front of the fan intakes, then you could probably get away with having this integrated onto the machine somewhere. But this is the way it is for now, and we're just going to use it like this. I think it would have been better if this was a fully enclosed power supply and they used some kind of passive cooling, like dissipating the heat into this gigantic metal base. And then you wouldn't need fans on here. But the solution they went with ain't too bad. At least it looks good. They're using a micro USB here. I think this is actually a mini USB. But I don't like many USB. Would have been nicer if they used USB-C on here. All right, and we got one of these. This little controller screen goes right here. Oh, this one has a USB-C connector. That's pretty sweet. Maybe they went with this mini USB because they were worried about you plugging the wrong thing in over here. And the only way to protect it was to use a different type of cable. I'll buy that excuse. Last thing to do. I think we just turn it on. Let's do this. Whoa. We're treated to a little light show. Hold on, let's point down a little bit so you can see this. Look at this thing. So I'm guessing there's some computer smarts in this box. So I guess it's more than just a power supply. All right, we got this nice little touch screen here. We can just pick it up and use it like a smartphone. This is awesome. Wow, and it's nice and responsive. This is faster than my smartphone. You know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this up to my Discord. So make sure you join the Discord so you can participate in questions like this. This thing certainly has a presence on your desk. It looks super professional. This appears to be made out of glass, so this should hold up pretty well over time. I've been reviewing the Sonic Pad, which has a plastic front screen. So as you touch it, you're going to scratch it up over time and it's going to look ugly. But this is a nice glass screen. And let's see if we have any sample files here. In classic Snapmaker fashion, your shiny little USB drive. That's pretty neat. I guess that just plugs in right over here. And there's nothing on there. Come on, guys. Give me some models to print. I guess one thing that they might be concerned about is if you loaded G-code onto this machine and someone just fired it up and tried running something, you really might run into an issue where you're running G-code for the laser cutter or the CNC head, but you've got the 3D printer attachment on there and it could mess some stuff up. So you definitely got to be a little careful making sure that you run the right kind of G-code on here. I just realized I did something wrong here. Um, so the whole thing about Poke Yoke that I've brought up multiple times, 
you know, idiot proofing your assemblies. Well, take a look at this. These are supposed to be up here. And since there's so many bolts in that linear pattern, I accidentally, I guess, installed it an inch back from where it's supposed to be. So that's kind of a big setback. I've got to unbolt all of those things on the bottom, shift that forwards, and then bolt it down again. Ah, yeah, that's a lot of bolts. There's so many bolts on this thing, I feel like they should actually provide you with an electric screwdriver, just because you've got so many dang bolts to do here. Last one here. And now I've got to shift that a little bit and bolt it back in place. All right, and then I'm gonna pull all of these wires in. I'll clean up my wire management a little bit. Now I guess I'll slice some models so that I can run a print on here, since apparently it doesn't come with any stock prints. Interesting choice. And we'll plug our USB drive in down here. All right, we've got our 3D Benchy G-Code loaded up and we're gonna hit start and see how long it takes. Now it looks like I can change the working speed, which is pretty neat. I'll probably be cranking that up as soon as we get started. Nozzle, temperature, heated bed, Z offset. I mean, this is a nice interface. This is way better than anything that I've seen before. Better than Prusa, better than Creality. It's just nice and snappy. You can hold it in your hand, type in your commands, get your G-Code started. That's pretty sweet. And when you're done with it, you can just set it right here and it magnetically snaps into place. We're actually gonna use this snap maker filament that they provided. Oh, this stuff looks kind of brittle. Looks like it got damaged in shipping despite all that extra packaging that they threw in there. Holy cow. That's not good. This is a quite brittle filament. I'm just gonna pull this off until we get to the broken part and we'll have to just throw all of that away. Actually, you know what, maybe I won't use this filament. I'll just set this aside and evaluate it later. But we started off with a bunch of wasted filament here because this just fell off of the spool. So as you can hear, there's quite a bit of fan noise. When the machine's at idle, this computer box over here makes a little bit of noise. It's not too bad. And the part cooling fan isn't on yet. This is just the hot end cooling fan. I think we could definitely replace this with something quieter. That's just unnecessary. Now you know what? My bed leveling is going to be all messed up because I had to readjust these um, y-axis rails. If you can recall, these were sticking off the front of the machine and I had to move them back so now they're sitting in these channels. That changed the Z height a little bit and it completely changed the leveling of the bed. So I'm actually going to have to pause this and repeat the bed leveling procedure, which is good because I'm not sure I recorded that the first time. So you'll get to see that. Let's stop this print. Go ahead, stop the print. You can do it. Stop, stop. I guess it has to finish the next line of G-code or something before it can stop the print. That's kind of annoying. Stop, 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 stop. Pause, stop, pause. Now we just gotta wait for it to stop. And then I'll repeat the bed leveling. So we'll go through that. It's actually pretty easy. I always appreciate it when they uh, build in a bed leveling tutorial and automate it as much as possible. And they've definitely done their job well here. Oh, here's an issue. Let's look up towards the top. You see the filament? The filament's coming off the spool now since it came all the way up here. And now if I fed this again, it's gonna get looped around and get all messed up. Yeah, that's not the best solution. Maybe they could have put the spool holder somewhere else. Maybe they could have added a Bowden tube. All right, let's go back to calibration. Calibrate the bed, start. When I fix the base, it's, it totally changed the angle of this base plate. So any bed leveling data that might have been there before is totally wrong now and it'll need to be recalibrated. So let's just go through this bed leveling procedure. It's really not too bad. I'll let you listen to this machine while it's working, just so you get a sense for the noise. We'll put the mic right over here. Alright, and then we level the last point manually, just to get the Z offset set correctly. It's a nice little hybrid of 
automated bed leveling and manual bed leveling. And that way, if it doesn't work when you're done, they can always blame you for screwing up. So at this point, I think I'm ready to get started with printing that Benchy out. It parses the G-code and then I can adjust the settings beforehand, the nozzle temperature or the heated bed, Z offset and work speed. I know sometimes in the G-code, it'll overwrite the temperatures as it's printing. Being able to set these beforehand seems pretty convenient. Let's go ahead and start the print just with the settings that we had before. I don't like how loud this machine is. It's definitely making some noise, but not every machine has to be super quiet. It's just kind of a shame because this machine looks so good, you would expect it to be shown off in an office environment. You'd be proud to have it on your desk, but when it's actually printing, it's making quite a bit of noise. See this filament? It came loose, and now as that feeds, it's gonna get wrapped around stuff. Now you can see this belt, this is the longest it'll have to stretch at any point during a print. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you've got enough slack to be able to reach all the way to this bottom left corner when it's down in the home position. But enough talking, let's get to printing. Looks like this first layer is going down pretty well. While we're printing here, I'm gonna see if I can do anything about this fan noise. It sounds like they're not using silent stepper drivers which is a bit of an oddity in this day and age. It could also be that we've just got so many metal parts that it's not damping the vibrations as well as some of the other budget 3D printers do. Also, it appears to be under extruding a little bit. We might have to do some flow calibration on this machine too. This is hard to do when the print head is moving, but there's no time like the present. So let's just get it done. Well, it seems like that bolt is stripped out which is unfortunate. So it looks like we've got a crazy little blower fan in here. It's just way too loud. Why do they do this? That's not necessary. Listen to the difference here. I'm gonna stop that fan. I guess they figured since their stepper motors are so loud, it doesn't matter if their fans are loud as hell too. All right, so that noise is kind of annoying. So one thing about this machine that makes it kind of unique among 3D printers is that it's designed to be a CNC machine as well. And CNCs have to contend with much higher tool forces. That means that these actuators are a little bit overbuilt for 3D printing. Now overbuilt implies that it's a bad thing, but there is one plus side to these being overbuilt, and that's that they should be able to handle very high accelerations. So we'll test that out. I'm gonna go ahead and turn up the work speed to, let's say, I don't know, how high does this go? Uh, 400%? That's going pretty fast. Um, I do wish the accelerations were a bit higher. All right, well, I'm just gonna let you listen to the sights and sounds of old school printers. This is what all 3D printers used to sound like, and I'm glad we're no longer in that era, but it sounds like we might have to deal with these noises again with the introduction of the Snapmaker A350. Here's a bit more of a realistic sound profile. I'm gonna put the microphone on the camera so it'll be about a meter away from the printer and you can get a sense for what it sounds like based on that setup. The one thing I do like about this hot end is they have a little bit of a cutout so you can see what's going on with the nozzle. That's always nice to see because then you can kind of observe what's going on with your prints. I can see a little bit of under extrusion here, but unfortunately in this menu that they have, there's no way to adjust the flow multiplier. So that seems like a calibration I'll have to do separately. All right, here's our little Benchy just finished up. If we compare it to another Benchy that I printed a little bit faster on an Ender 5 S1 using Clipper, you can see um, they look about the same at first glance, but if we take a closer look, you can notice these edges are much sharper on the one printed on the Snapmaker, and that has to do with how rigid this machine is. 
it can quickly change directions and handle those higher accelerations without the belts stretching and whipping the tool head around. So I think this will be a much more accurate printer when you're printing at speed. However, the absolute speed is a little bit lower. This one printed in, I think, 40 minutes on the Ender 5 S1 using Clipper. This one printed in, let's see, um, 58 minutes total print time. I think that includes some of the waiting time for letting this bed heat up, but overall, pretty good result. You can see the bow of the Benchy is a little bit warped. That indicates that there's insufficient part cooling on this machine for printing at these speeds. One other thing is the retractions were set too high. Um, it had a 5mm retraction, and that was the default settings on Cura for this machine. And I think it would be more appropriate to use a retraction setting of about 1.2 millimeters for something like this. Also, I'm just going to close this up. It's awfully proprietary, so I don't really see the point in modifying it. It'll be a lot of work with not much payoff. And besides, this one fan is not the biggest source of noise on the machine, and it turns off when it's not actually printing. Now, as you may have guessed, for a heated bed of this size, it takes quite a while for it to get up to temperature. That's just one of the inherent limitations of one of these large print beds. You're spreading out that wattage over a much larger area, so it just takes longer to heat up. This takes about seven or eight minutes to get up to temperature. Now, I still can't disconnect. This is kind of weird. Okay, and I was able to disconnect from the software here. But let's connect back to it, and, and I'll just send I'll this, to, send the this to the device. That's probably the That's better, probably way, to better way to do it. So it just downloaded the G-code to this machine, and now I'll start the project now. We'll hit start. It gives you a nice little preview of the thing that you're, you're doing. But it says unable to start the job. Please check the machine and try again. Uh, why can't I start the job there? Well, that's about all I want to do with that software. I'll have to just stick with Cura, and I'll, I'll tune my profiles there. Now I need to save this to the disk and load it onto the printer using the thumb drive. We're going to run our 10K acceleration Benchy. We'll see if that's able to print any faster. So I increased the accelerations to 10K. I also lowered the uh, retractions to 1.2 millimeters. So this should just be a faster print overall. Let's see how it does. Now, it won't even print. Start. Unable to start the job. Please check your machine settings and try again. Well, ain't that some bullshit. I don't know what the deal is with that. I'm just gonna restart the printer, see if that's able to fix it. Also, if you take a look at this Benchy, there's clear indications of under extrusion here. This is not a very strong part. It's pretty easy to break. There's some issues going on with the adhesion in there. So, I mean, I guess there's some issue where I had to restart the machine. That's cool. Um, I would like to calibrate this machine, actually, because that under extrusion is gonna cause issues. So let me go back. Uh, I wish there was a way to get back to the god dang first menu, but I have to wait for it to do its stupid print cancellation thing. Okay, you gonna let me stop yet? No? I guess I just have to restart the machine. All right, let's try that again. Yes, Snapmaker, very cool. Now, will you let me do something with the machine? No, nope, don't want to power recover. Let's go to our calibration options. Going home, okay, sure. Okay. Nozzle, all right, sure. I don't have the options that I want here. I want to do some flow compensation. There's only one type of calibration in this calibration menu which is basically doing mesh bed leveling. I don't see any options for, let's see, advanced settings, 3D printing, calibration grid, sure, that's already been done, auto leveling on, yeah, this is kind of BS. I can't fix anything that I want to fix. I'll download this update, might as well. That is a little troubling that it's under extruding and there's no way for me to fix it. Most printers allow you to adjust the flow rate. I'm gonna see what Google has for me. So extruder calibration is a must in the Snapmaker. Let's see what people are saying. 
my A350 was set with the extruder value of 21 whatever it needs to be 24.6 yeah there's a 15 percent inaccuracy and it results in significant under extrusion so this is an issue that someone brought up almost three years ago that's two and a half years ago and he's saying that he's bringing it up again indicating that it was an issue even further in the past so um yeah, I guess I need to fix this. So I want to change my extruder to... What is this shit? There's like all this Twitter stuff popping up. Even Snapmaker's website is annoying. Like I just want to copy and paste this and when I select something to copy it, it pops up all this stuff. Oh, do you want to do a Twitter? Do you want to email this? No, go away. Holy cow, this is annoying. So copy this. Um, so I, I guess I'll need to go into Luben. And let's go to 3D printing. I guess maybe workspace, according to this gentleman on the internet, lady or gentleman, Chazer33GTR, M92. Well, that's not very useful now, is it? Am I sending G code to this thing or what? Uh, okay, well, I'm updating the controller right now, so we'll just have to wait for that. Okay, updated successfully. Now we'll try to connect to it on my computer. Hopefully it saved its mesh bed leveling information from before the, uh, the update. Try our M92 command. Unknown command, M92. Okay, that's cool. Capital M92. All right, there we go. So the extruder is set to 212. It's common knowledge that that's too low. So I'm going to type in this command, which should increase the extrusion multiplier for the extruder. And then I need to follow it up with an M503. Oh, capital M503. So that did the job, probably. Now when I press M92, we got our correct extrusion multiplier. Great news. Okay, time to do the manual bed leveling part again. Is there a menu here? Uh, is this a firmware bug? It's not giving me the option to... Oh, there we go. I will say this bed leveling is nice and easy. All right, let's get printing. Now actually you can see up here how this causes a bit of an issue when you've got this this filament that ends up just hanging off to the side. Now it's going to wrap itself around the, the side column and that could cause some issues. So to prevent that from happening I'm just going to grab it and wind it back up over the spool and get it so it's coming down from the front like this. Alright here goes, we'll see how fast this thing can go. We cranked up the acceleration, fixed the under extrusion, and we'll just turn those speeds up and see how quickly we can get a benchy out. That extrusion looks much better. It might actually be over extruding a little bit at this point, but I'd rather have that than under extrusion. Under extrusion makes for wimpy prints. Just look at this. They just fall apart. That's, that's wimpy. We don't want prints like this. 10K accelerations, this thing's doing pretty good by the looks of it. For some reason it's connected to my computer again, which I don't really want. I want to run this print off of the printer, so I'm going to go ahead and disconnect. What? I don't like that. I, I disconnected it before I started the print, and it reconnected itself, and now I can't run commands off of here, I think. I don't know. But what that means is I can adjust the work speed off of this interface here. We'll set it to a thousand percent. Oh, it tops out at 500. I'm cool with 500. Alright, this thing seems pretty capable of printing at high speeds. Um, its part cooling is a bit weak, and it is going to be a kind of a pain in the ass to upgrade because of this fully enclosed module. But it looks like we're going to be able to go pretty dang fast. Well, let's switch over to time lapse mode and we'll just see this thing print. I haven't really done any optimization with these settings, but it's printing pretty dang fast. And it sounds like it's printing fast too. You can see it'll pause every now and then, and that's when it's doing these retraction moves. It's set to 5 millimeters of retractions, so we're actually losing a lot of time with those retractions. And if I turn those down in the slicer, I should be able to cut down the print time quite a bit. I actually really like the hot end design. You can see it's just a chunk of aluminum with the heat brake sticking out the top, the nozzle sticking out the bottom, and then they shoved the two things that are important in on this side. 
and it's just like this long skinny thing that's designed to hold on to that heater cartridge and the uh, thermistor. So it's just a really minimal, simple design, and I really like it. The things that I don't like about it, though, are that this is a PTFE line taut end, which will limit your temperature to basically only printing PLA. I'd like to replace this with an all-metal hot end, and also um, it'd be nice to put a higher flow nozzle on here. I guess there's nothing stopping me from doing that, so I can just unscrew this and put like a CHT nozzle in there if I wanted. So, pretty slick design. I also, I also really like their connector choice here. This is a really sweet connector for the job because it handles your heater cartridge wiring as well as the thermistor wiring all in one plug. So this is pretty sweet. I would like to see this used in more printers. Aside from those ceramic heater core hot ends that I like to use, this is probably the most minimal design I've seen. Here's the ceramic heater core type of hot end. It's super minimal as well. But I think this has it beat with the simpler wiring. I mean, just having this four pin wire here is awesome. But it's great to see that these designs are getting so refined and small which basically means they can drive the cost down and also push higher print speeds and have tighter integration with their packaging. So it's a win-win for everybody with all these smaller and more advanced hot ends coming out. Now let's see how this thing's doing. It's just hauling. It's going super fast. If we look at the elapsed time, this is 32 minutes so far. And the Benchy is 73% done. So this should finish in about 45 minutes. And we're losing a lot of time just on those retractions. I mean, you can see it stopping and doing the retractions over and over again. That's just because the retractions were set way too high. Five millimeters is totally excessive for a direct drive extruder like this. You can turn that down quite a bit. And let's see, also we can turn up the work speed on the computer here. I'm actually gonna stop this print because I want to see how fast it can go with those smaller retractions. And it did it again. It's doing that dang filament thing that's causing it an issue. So I definitely need to print something out or find some solution for that because having the filament wrapped around that side pillar is not going to be good. So this Benchy was produced pretty fast. How fast? I don't really know. Oh, here it says uh, 44 minutes. That's pretty good time. Overhangs don't look the best. It could definitely use some better part cooling. But this machine hauls pretty fast and it looks like the stringing was really well controlled. So what do I think about the Snapmaker A350? Well, it's got a huge build volume and it seems to be able to handle pretty fast accelerations. So it's a pretty competent 3D printer. But then again, it should be given its $1,400 asking price. That's pretty steep for something like this, considering the Artillery Sidewinder X2 is, let's see, about a sixth the price. So you could get a whole fleet of Sidewinder X2s for the price of this machine, and you'd be able to just churn out prints with a similarly sized build volume. But with this one, you just get one machine, and while it is beautifully designed, it was quite a bit of work to put together, and the print quality isn't blowing anyone's mind. Also, I can't say I'm a fan of the proprietary firmware. I love this screen, it's super nice, but this isn't running Clipper or anything open source, so I'm concerned about how well it's gonna be supported over time. The cable management could use a little work. If you look up here, we've got the cable for the X-axis and the hot end, and down here we've got the cable for the Y-axis and the heated bed. And it's not really well controlled, they're just kind of flopping around back there. There's no place to plug in an SD card, and there's just a, a lot of other small complaints about this machine that I won't bother going all the way into. But overall, this was a more difficult build experience than I've had with most of my other 3D printers. Also, the issue with the filament management up at the top, with it tending to get wrapped around that side support because the print head moving up and down causes too much slack, that's kind of annoying. So really where this machine should stand out is the laser cutter and CNC capabilities. So if we want to switch this over to a laser cutter, we'll just take off this print bed 
And then we'll have to remove this heated build tray so it doesn't get damaged. So I'll have to undo one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty-one, twenty-two fasteners. And then redo those fasteners with these laser-proof slats installed. Alright, so then I have to redo all of those fasteners to get this put in place, which seems like a lot of work if you ask me. Then I would need to unplug this tool head, undo four fasteners in the back, and then install this laser head. There's kind of an issue with this laser head in that there's no enclosure for this machine. So you're just firing a laser downwards at this gigantic surface that has a bunch of reflective stuff on it potentially. I mean, I get that they're black anodized aluminum, so they should do a pretty good job of absorbing the laser radiation. But you've got these, uh, these fasteners. But I assume they're shiny, just like the rest of the fasteners on this machine. So you've got some really shiny fasteners that are definitely going to be scattering laser light, potentially into your eyeballs and making you blind. I mean, this just seems like a really bad idea. It can potentially blind you if you're in the same room with it, so that seems like a bit of an oversight. It's got a little camera on here, and I guess with Wi-Fi control you can like set up the job and run it from another room if you want to be extra safe. Then we've also got this CNC machine attachment, so instead of putting the laser head on, let me just sweep these out of the way. If I had installed these, I would have to undo, you know, 20 something screws to remove these. Then I'd put this down and put those 20 something screws back into this board to secure it to the movable Y axis. Then you can switch this over to being a CNC machine. And here we have the CNC tool head. So you would just unscrew four screws in the back there and put this CNC tool head in instead. Then you can go machine stuff. With CNC machining, you have this long intricate process of describing to the machine exactly where things are. It's like a slicer, but you have to give it a lot more information. So yeah, I don't really like CNC machining as much. I kind of messed with some CNCs early on in my channel's existence, but I quickly just settled on doing 3D printer content because unless you're making real structural parts out of steel or aluminum, there's not a whole lot of point of doing CNC machining. Yeah, I guess you can do some intricate wood carvings, which are very pretty, but the amount of work that you have to do is, uh, it's a lot. One of the use cases I can see is being able to do PCB prototyping with it. That'd be pretty handy. So at the end of the day, let's take a look at what the Snapmaker really offers you. It's a well-designed machine. In terms of industrial design, the looks of this thing and the clean lines, it all looks awesome. And in theory, it'd be really cool to have one machine that can do laser cutting, 3D printing, and CNC machining all at once. However, the reality is you end up with a compromised machine that doesn't excel in any of its tasks. For instance, I was able to print out this 3D Benchy. This was printed in about 40 minutes. However, I can hear this machine from the opposite side of my house, and it's just making those screechy stepper motor noises. So just looking at it at, through the scope of it being a 3D printer, it's not super fast. It appears to be very difficult to mod. This is all just kind of built into this brick. I mean, this thing would be a nightmare to reverse engineer and repair. So you're basically gonna be reliant on Snapmaker to provide all of your support. And they may provide excellent support, but I prefer to have options outside of the manufacturer to be able to upkeep and upgrade my devices. In terms of 3D printing, this should have been thought out a little bit better. This filament is constantly getting tangled around this edge this pillar and it's going to get caught, it might break the filament, and then you're just going to ruin a print. This extruder is pretty well designed. I mean, it performs well, it's direct drive. These replacement hot end modules are super sleek and I love what they've done with the wire management there. So it's definitely a good design from that perspective, but the fan noise, I mean, come on, the fan noise. Can we just get some quiet fans on there? And on most of my other machines, I just take it apart and slap on one of these Noctua fans that are super quiet. But on this machine, it's going to be extremely difficult to do that just because of all this proprietary nonsense. The cable management, I mean, it's an elegant solution in a way, but you end up with all these wires hanging off the side because they're all exposed. Just tuck these away somewhere, you know, just stick them underneath the base of the machine or something. I don't want to see them. 
Then you've got this secondary box over here. I'm not sure what this box does. I don't know if it's a computer or if it's doing something important. By the way, this Benchy was printed on a Ender 5 S1, so don't attribute this glorious print to this machine. I really like the touch screen. It's super responsive. It's probably one of the best interfaces that I've seen on a machine in terms of its touch responsiveness and clarity and the fact that you can just pick it up and hold on to it like a phone. This is really cool. But what would have been even cooler is if, you know, you want to go this route, have an app you can install on your phone and control the printer through the app. So then instead of picking up the secondary phone and using this for everything, that'd be cool if I could just control it directly on my phone. The fact that when you hook your computer up to the printer it was a little confusing to me and it overrode a bunch of the controls on this thing. So overall the noise of this machine is a bit much. Um, the print performance is pretty good but there's some ergonomics issues and controllability issues. Um, I like that you can send G-code from their slicer. That's a pretty cool feature that I'd like to see in more 3D printers. But other than that, this thing is not really optimized around being a 3D printer. If you take a look at the Artillery Sidewinder X2, that thing is very similar in terms of its performance and size and speed, but it's insanely cheaper compared to this because you're not having to overbuild every single joint to handle the forces of a CNC machine when really you just need to handle the forces of a hot end that you're flinging around. Also, this thing doesn't have an all-metal hot end. It's got a PTFE lining inside of there. I'll try not to labor the points too much on this thing. I would give it a C grade in terms of being a 3D printer just because of its high price point and loud, annoying operational noises between those stepper motors and those fans. It's just kind of unacceptable in my opinion. If you wanted to switch this over to using the laser module, you could do that, but you'd also be risking blinding yourself so, I don't know. That seems like a, a bad trade-off to me. We can just throw this one in the trash. I don't want to use the laser module one bit. So, I don't really feel like I need to explain that much more. It's a safety hazard, so let's just keep it out of our lives. I would say pretty much any other laser cutter on the market is going to be much safer than one of these 3D printer slash laser cutters. Because with the laser cutter, at least you always know that it's going to be in a certain plane pointing down. And basically the way that they designed this, you're always going to have reflective materials, fasteners, I mean this aluminum, if you burn off or scrape off some of this anodized coating, then it's just going to be a perfectly reflective material that's ready to blind you at a moment's notice. And then we've got the CNC head. Now the CNC head, I can see that being kind of useful. And this thing is definitely built more like a CNC machine than a 3D printer. However, with the number of fasteners that you have to undo just to switch over to that CNC functionality, it's something like uh, between 25 and 30 fasteners that you have to undo, remove the old parts, put the new parts on, and then redo 20 to 30 fasteners. That's just kind of a pain in the ass, and that's something that I don't want to do. If I'm going to keep using this machine, I'll probably use it as a CNC machine and just kind of forget about the other features. It seems to be pretty well built for that. This is a bed slinger CNC machine, which is an interesting concept. I guess it's not that all that uncommon. And maybe you can prototype some PCBs on it. So I could see this being somewhat useful for that. I don't really know what else is on the market at this price point. I mean, this is over a thousand dollars. So, I mean, CNC machine, we're not going to be using it for a while just because of all the extra fasteners and crap that I'll have to deal with if I want to use it. So where does that leave this with this machine? And what are its real strengths? Well, I would say it's got a really strong frame, definitely really heavy. Um, seems really uh, like it's got a lot of fasteners on it. It looks good. I mean, you can't deny that this thing looks good. It looks like something that came out of the Apple Design Studios. All this space gray and stuff. It's got these nice LEDs and this machined vent grate on the front. All these sleek wires. They cover up all of the belts and gears and pulleys and stuff that you normally have to see on a 3D printer. I mean, just look at these other 3D printers. Oh, well, actually the Sidewinder looks pretty good. You know, they got these nice cables. It's arguably got better wire management than this thing. Um, also, it's a lot cheaper and it seems to be built for a single purpose, which is to be a 3D printer, which uh, it excels at. 
Then we've got other printers like this. These are kind of ugly, but you know, they get the job done and they're really tiny and lightweight. This thing's just a gigantic hunk, super heavy. I almost threw out my back when I was trying to get it in the door here. I mean, it would look good in an office. Those are some strengths, right? And also, I really like the manufacturing methods they used. They optimized the heck out of these parts. These are die-cast aluminum parts. Going to be really strong. Also, it's got Wi-Fi connectivity, which, you know, anything with Clipper is going to do a better job of that than this will. But, uh, yeah, you've got the screen, but then again, you can get similar things on other printers and stuff. So I'm left scratching my head with what the real strengths of this machine are. I mean, basically it's just a, a beauty pageant project. It, it looks nice. And I guess if you're a tech startup or you're a designer and you want something sitting on your desk in your studio, this will definitely fit the bill of making you look really snooty and like you're rich and you can afford nice tools. But let's get to the cons of this machine because that's where we have a little bit more to talk about. So, I mean, this thing just bothers me. This keeps going around basically every time I start a print because the print head moves up to the top to home and then it gets all this slack and then this loops around there and you're going to have issues with this. I mean, then you've got this print head that makes a ton of noise. The fan is super loud and it's proprietary bullshit that I can't replace. All the proprietary cables and connectors here, it's like, why can't we just use some screw terminals or like some XT30 connectors or something that's a little more common? Maybe some 2.5 millimeter JST connectors. I mean, those seem to work just fine for every other 3D printer. Or maybe even ribbon cables like what you got on the artillery sidewinder, which is a cleaner solution than what we have here. Other weaknesses, let's see. I mean, the, the motors are loud, so... You definitely know when your print is done, even when you're on the opposite side of your house because you can just hear the ringing of the motors running. And when the motors stop ringing and, and uh, you feel like you can finally get some sleep, then you know your print is done, so you gotta come down here and check on it. Um, other cons, we've got this separate box. Generally, you know, you've got a relatively large appliance here. You can find some place to strap that to it or build it into the bottom or something. These fasteners are just kind of not the best choice. You're fastening into this loop and if you over tighten them it feels like it's going to break something. In fact when I was putting this together it really felt like I was going to break something and I don't know maybe something's wrong there now. Don't overcomplicate things. If you need to screw something and attach it to something else just give me a hole to put the screw in and then I put the screw in there and then it holds it in place. All right, it doesn't have to be complicated. Let's see, we've got all these extra holes on it, which gives it the illusion of being moddable. But this thing is, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's actually going to be that moddable. Like, if I wanted to actually change something on here, it'd be too difficult. Really, all these extra holes do is add extra manufacturing cost and give you more opportunities to put the thing together incorrectly. Yeah, so I've got a lot of thoughts about this machine. That just seems like a nightmare to be able to fix. You're definitely going to be suckling on the teat of Snapmaker if you want to get your repairs done. Uh, let's see, what else? What do we have? This, this is just such a pain to change out. I mean, they call it Snapmaker. I feel like it should snap together, you know, snap this off, snap something else on, and then make some things. But really, you're going to be spending all day undoing fasteners and putting them back in if you want to switch back and forth between CNCing and 3D printing. So, I mean, if you're going to be investing that much time in switching things over, that's just kind of a waste of time. That's non-value-added time. Generally, you want to minimize your non-value-added time because that's not adding value. That's just wasting your time. And, uh, yeah. So it would be much better to just buy a 3D printer and a CNC and a laser cutter, which you could easily afford for the price tag of this machine. So the other downside is it looks like we had to cut down an entire rainforest in Southeast Asia to be able to package this thing. I mean, just look at all these boxes. Look at all these boxes. What is this? This is all just from, this is just from one device. How does this happen? I don't understand. So anyways, I wanted to give a huge thanks to Snapmaker for sending me this machine to review. It was really fun. I think the machine looks great. And if you've got um, the asking price of about $1,400 to spend, this would be a great way to spend it because then you'd get a CNC machine, 
a 3D printer and a laser cutter all in one, which not many other machines will offer that. So this is definitely going to be a good choice for that. So thanks for watching this review. I hope you found it useful. And remember to make something wonderful.